What's up guys, Ben here and welcome to Motivation to Invest. Benjamin Graham is the father of value investing and Warren Buffett is his greatest student. Benjamin Graham actually wrote a book back in 1949 called The Intelligent Investor, which Warren Buffett states is the greatest investing book ever written. And here it is. This is an incredible book and it's jam packed full of investing secrets. However, one major issue with the book is as it was written back in 1949, it can be quite difficult to decipher. So in this video to help you guys out, I've gone through each and every chapter of this book and read it cover to cover. I then recorded mini vlogs each time I read a chapter over a period of a few weeks. So in this video, I've compiled together my mini vlogs to give you guys a brief overview of The Intelligent Investor, an exceptional book on value investing. So without further ado, let's dive in. Welcome back guys to Motivation to Invest. Before we get started, go ahead, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. That allows us to continue to create more great content like this for you guys. In addition, if you would like more investment tips and exclusive stock market picks, which I personally have invested into, then you should definitely subscribe to this channel. Be sure to turn the notification bell on, that way you'll get notified when a great stock is at a great price. So that being said, let's get into the video. On to chapter six, the portfolio policy for the enterprising investor, negative approach. The aggressive investor should start from the same base as the defensive investor, namely a division of his funds between high-grade bonds and high-grade common stocks bought at reasonable prices. Basically, in this chapter, Benjamin Graham discusses that you should not chase bond yields. He likens bond yields to sex in a marriage and basically says if you marry just for sex and the sex wears out, then what else have you got? You're going to be asking that question. So don't chase a bond just because the yield is good. Look at the company behind it. Look at the issuer and look at the quality behind these bonds. Um, he also discusses IPOs, which are very interesting, very exciting for many people. So these are initial public offerings. So these are new companies which are just becoming public on floating and floating on the stock exchange. Now, a lot of exciting companies. However, there are many risks with these namely the psychological risk. The psychological risk is that everybody wants to bag the next Microsoft, the next Amazon, the next Google, and that's on their mind when they think of IPOs. For example, if you purchase Amazon at its IPO, I believe it was in 1997, say you put in a thousand dollars, you'd have um, $500,000 by 2009 and I think $800,000 by 2020. Now that is a fantastic return from just $1,000. However, for, for those specific winners, there are many, many losers. So basically, be cautious of IPOs is Benjamin Graham's thoughts on this. As a lot of the first value in these companies are given to large institutions before they even go public. So the price already starts off higher than it should be when it's initially floated. What else is he saying here? He says, oh yeah, IPO should probably stand for it's probably overpriced. Imaginary profits only or idiotic, preposterous and outrageous. So be cautious of IPOs. There are some winners there, but just be cautious. On to chapter seven, the portfolio policy for the enterprising investor, the positive side. Graham states that the enterprising investor by definition will devote a fair amount of his attention and efforts towards obtaining a better than run-of-the-mill investment result. He doesn't state, however, that you will take more risk. Some of Benjamin Graham's favorite stocks to invest in are those of unpopular, great, large companies. Now, what he means by this is you look for a great company. He wants it to be large so it's more financially stable. However, then he invests in it when it is unpopular for example, there's an issue on the news, um, it's being sued or there's, there's something going on, the sentiment is bad for the company, then that can sometimes be a great time to invest into it. And that makes you a true contrarian investor. 
So they're the sort of stocks that Benjamin Graham looks for and he advises. Another element to this is to analyze the company's sort of price to earnings ratio and the company's price to book value ratio. So if a company's assets like net cash is equal to its market cap, then you're effectively purchasing the company for free. You're just buying the cash on its balance sheet. Now that is a great deal to have, whereas usually you'll pay 10 times the earnings, 15 times the earnings, 20 times the earnings. So that's just something else to look out for as a more enterprising investor. Right guys, so I've just been to the gym, but I've managed to squeeze out a couple of chapters. So chapter 11, security analysis for the late investor, a general approach. So this basically looks at how to analyze a stock's value and its potential future value. First point is general long-term prospects. The main point from this book basically shows that a lot of these Wall Street analysts do not know what they're talking about. So if I just show you this graph here, as you can see, there was a comparison between chemical companies and oil companies during the 1970s. And what you can see here is that despite the oil companies having a lower price to earnings ratio, which showed people weren't as optimistic on them, they actually ended up with a higher earnings per share, as you can see here, uh, much higher earnings per share compared to the lower earnings per share of the chemical companies, despite they had a higher PE ratio. So that's just something to look out for. Apologize for the camera angle. Another point is management. So basically, with regards to management, you want to see that the management has got skin in the game. So are they buying shares when their shares are fairly valued? Are they inside a purchasing? Are they not inside a selling, which is not good to see? Are they, do they have integrity and honesty? So if you look at their annual reports, do they make promises and then do they keep their promises? And if not, if situations happen, do they take responsibility? Are they accountable? Or do they blame intrinsic factors, the economy, um, there's not been a demand, etc. You wanna look out for these characteristics when you're analyzing management teams. Another point is financial strength and capital structure. So with regards to financial strength, you want to look at what's called owner earnings. So you want to look at the earnings after amortization and depreciation. So you want to see how much profit is there per share and is that rising over time? Is the company's revenue increases? Is its net income increasing? Is its operating margin steady or increasing? Is its return on capital employed increasing? So for every dollar the company invests, how much does that return in value for the shareholder? These are all factors which you need to analyze when you're looking at a stock. With regards to capital structure, this is how the company is financed. So what is the debt to asset ratio? This can be found with the current ratio. So for example, if a business has a current ratio of one, that means it can pay off its debts with its cash flow once. If it has a current ratio of two, it means it has enough cash to pay off its debts twice. Generally, you need to look for a minimum of being over one, so say 1.52, and anything higher is great. Below one is a worrying sign. It means the company has higher debt than cash flow. Then this chapter also looks at how to value a stock in the future. You can use, say, discounted cash flow calculations, um, an example here, they call it capitalization rates for growth stocks. So they say value equals current normal earnings times 8.5 plus twice the expected annual growth rate. It's best to be conservative when coming up with an annual growth rate for a business. Let's say you think the business is going to grow at 20% per year. Then why not estimate at, say, 10% or 15% to just give yourself a more of a realistic estimate should things not occur the way you think they should. To chapter 12 things to consider about per share earnings so yeah guys in this chapter it generally talks about the accounting principles that you should be aware of so a lot of companies they use accounting tricks to make their earnings seem greater than they are one example of this is say they have an expense say for example construction costs they can move them to the next year the next year's worth of accounting or they can move them to from the income statement 
to say the balance sheet and label them as assets. So you just need to be very careful of that. Um, a great thing that you should do is on a company's annual report is to always check the footnotes because the footnotes will show you what the company is hiding. And a great tip in this book is to start reading annual report from the back because that's the stuff that the company is hiding and doesn't want you to see. So just be aware of that and the accounting tricks that these businesses use. On to chapter 13, it's quite a short chapter. Basically in chapter 13, a big point it talks about is stock splits. So this is when a company says, we're gonna split the stock in two. So say for example, you have one pound, if you're from the UK, one pound. And I say, I'm gonna take your one pound and give you two 50 pence pieces. Then I'm gonna ask you, do you feel richer? Now, of course you're gonna say, no, like it's just the same. Two 50 pence pieces equals a pound, it's exactly the same. However, what companies notice is when they did a stock split or even announced to do a stock split, the stock price jumped by over 20%. Now this is because if people have more stocks, they feel necessarily, they did feel richer. Companies were taking advantage of this and announcing stock splits to boost the price. So that's just something you need to watch out for and also be aware if a company decides to split the stock and just psychologically keep yourself in check that it's not gonna make you any richer. To chapter 15, stock selection for the enterprising investor. So in this chapter, Benjamin Graham basically discusses the best methods and techniques you can use for more of an enterprising investor. So that's someone who wants to be actively involved in picking stocks. So there's a few um, of Benjamin Graham's principles. One is a margin of safety. So you want to calculate the value of a business and then invest in the business when the share price is below that value to give yourself a margin of safety. Getting the business value, look at the price to earnings ratio. Does it have a low price to earnings ratio? You also want to look for things like um, increasing dividends. Has the dividend payment been increasing steadily over the past few years? Of looking for businesses with a moat or a competitive advantage, a strong brand, and then investing into them. As one Buffett says, it's better to buy a great company at a fair price than a fair company at a good price. So there's just a few points to look at. Chapter 19, shareholders and management, dividend policy. So Benjamin Graham is a big advocate of companies paying dividends to their shareholders. Although many companies say that they will not pay dividends in order to reinvest those profits into the business, Benjamin Graham hates this and thinks that the shareholders should always be treated fairly as they effectively own the company. He also believes that management shouldn't be given massive bonuses for poor performance of the stock. So when you're investing into a business, you want to look at the management and the CEO's compensation. For example, the great Steve Jobs, when he was fired from Apple and returned, he was actually given a salary of just $1 per year as he was already a wealthy man. However, a few years later, he was actually given a $90 million Gulfstream jet and half a billion dollars worth of stocks. Now, he, he is an amazing guy and he did do a lot for Apple, but is he worth half a billion and a Gulfstream jet as compensation? So as a shareholder, you've got to think, is that was that the right compensation for him as a CEO? And there's many examples of this where people who are a lot less influential than Steve Jobs. Chapter 20, the margin of safety as a central concept of investing. The margin of safety is Benjamin Graham's most important principle, which you guys should know. Honestly, the concept of margin of safety has changed my investing career, and it's also changed Warren Buffett's. Basically, with the margin of safety, there's a great quote by Warren Buffett. It says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. So with a margin of safety, you want to be paying below fair value for the stock. Now, you can purchase a stock when the news is bad and there's a bad sentiment on the stock, as long as the business fundamentals are still good. This can give you a margin of safety when investing. An example when I used this principle was during the 2020 oil crash. So oil prices went negative, demand had dropped and supply was very high. This was a terrible time for oil and in the short term, there was a lot of negative sentiment on the oil industry. 
So what did I do? Well, I was a true contrarian. I observed the masses and did the opposite. I observed that yes, oil was going through a tough time in the short term, but in the long term, I believed it would recover. So I analyzed the best businesses in an industry with bad sentiment, and I discovered Shell, BP and Chevron. Three gigantic, well-diversified oil mammoths who also had low debt. And these are the businesses which I invested in at very fair valuations, giving me a margin of safety for further decreases. Those stocks, those stocks have since increased by over 60% in just three weeks. So they were incredible investments and it's all down to the margin of safety. So which of Benjamin Graham's value investing principles resonated the most with you? Comment your thoughts below and I'll join in the discussion. In addition, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. And if you'd like more stock market investing tips and exclusive stock picks, which I personally have invested into, then you should definitely subscribe to this channel. And with that being said, I will see you guys on the next video. Invest safe.